One of the strangest teachings of Jesus happens in Matthew chapter 12. So why don't you turn in your Bibles over to Matthew chapter 12 just for a moment. And we're going to use this as a launch pad for Deuteronomy 7. Jesus unveiled a spiritual reality in the physical world. And it's a very interesting and intriguing thing that he says. And it has a very specific interpretation. I'll, I'll get there in a bit this morning. But listen to it first out. Matthew chapter 12, verse 43, Jesus said, Now when the unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless places seeking rest and does not find it. And then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds it unoccupied, swept, and put in order. And then it goes and takes along with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there, and the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. That is the way it will also be with this evil generation. And it's one of those teachings of Jesus, I am convinced, that left his apostles standing there going, huh? Well, what, what do you mean, Jesus? You know, I'm sure there were certain apostles saying, well, that's just good demonology. And there were others saying, I have no idea what this means. And still others trying to grasp the application. Why is Jesus saying this here? What is this about? Let me give you the generality of it. Wickedness abhors a vacuum. Wickedness abhors a vacuum. That is, evil will fill any unoccupied space. And sin is insatiable, it is unsatisfiable, it can never get enough, it always wants more. Proverbs 27 verse 20 says, Sheol and Abaddon, that is destruction, are never satisfied, nor are the eyes of man ever satisfied. See, that's the sin nature that causes us to always want more than what we've got. Proverbs 30 verse 15, there are three things that will not be satisfied, four that will not say enough. Sheol, the barren womb, earth that is never satisfied with water, and fire that never says enough. John said in 1 John 2, 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And such is sin. Sin is ravenous. Sin wants to fill the empty place. Sin is hungry. It is voracious. And the only option is to put it down. I'm talking about sin. Put it down and fill the empty space with righteousness. Put down the sin, fill the space with righteousness. Put down the sin, fill the space with with righteousness. Proverbs 28 verse 28 says, when the wicked rise, men hide themselves, but when they perish, the righteous increase. Deuteronomy chapter 7 has more words to take to heart. Speaking to and about Israel as a people, that's the direct interpretation, but to us personally, there is some amazing application, especially where sin is concerned in our lives, where wicked things are concerned, where the desire of the evil one is for you. As God said so long ago to Cain, sin desires you. It's crouching at the door. It, it wants you, but you must master it. And most of us hear that and we go, master sin. I, I don't, how do we do that? We have a call on our lives, and you need to understand going into this this morning that the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. We don't fight flesh battles. They are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5, destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God and taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. I want to stop right there and give you a very specific example that I talked about real briefly on Wednesday night, but I think may have been misunderstood. Vaccinations and masks. <laughs> I use that as an example of the insanity of the world that we're in, and, and, and different people heard different things from me. Let me just be clear. I don't care if you've been vaccinated. I mean, I care. I care for you. I care about you deeply. But I don't care if you've been vaccinated or not. 
I don't care if you choose to wear a mask or not. That, to me, is completely beside the point. As a follower of Jesus Christ, what I care about is how we bear Jesus in this world. That if you have chosen to be vaccinated, that you walk with love and compassion for everybody, whether they have or not. If you've chosen not to be vaccinated, you walk with love and compassion and care for everybody, whether they have or not. You see what I'm saying? That I think this is where, and I mentioned, I think the church has missed it. We've missed an opportunity to walk with the grace and the mercy and the love of Christ. And, and instead, we've been, we've been drawn into, dragged into either the political side of everybody's got to be vaccinated and we've got to mandate this, or the other political side which says, I have my rights and you can't tell me what to do. No, we can't. I can't. I wouldn't. <laughs> That's not the issue. Your rights or forcing others, that is not the issue. The issue for us is to love one another and to be Christ in this world and to share the gospel and to care more about each other than about our politics. And that's what I was trying to get at. I hope that makes sense now that the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. That's not our concern. Our concern is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our concern is that people are saved for eternity, whatever medical decisions we make on earth here and now. We are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Now, let's get back to Deuteronomy 7. How does this all apply? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob never owned property in the promised land. You, you realize that. With, with two little exceptions, two burial plots, Abraham bought a burial cave the cave of Machpelah at Hebron, and Jacob bought a burial plot in Shechem, but aside from that, a place to bury their dead, they owned no property in the land that God said is yours, the land that he promised to them. Now with that, understand that in Genesis 14, we learn that Abraham goes to war with 318 devoted servants. If you do the math and think it through, it's been estimated that Therefore, Abraham probably had in his household as many as 2,000 men, women, children serving and working in the household of Abraham. He was a very wealthy man, very blessed by the Lord. Isaac had even more, was even in a larger company. Genesis chapter 26, verse 12, the Lord blessed him and the man became rich and continued to grow richer until he became very wealthy for he had possessions of flocks and herds and a great household so that the Philistines envied him. So Abraham had a huge household. Isaac had even larger. And when the house of Jacob went down to Egypt, 70 in number, the Bible tells us there were 70 in number. That is Jacob and his 11 sons at the time Joseph was already in Egypt and their children and their wives and their servants. Can you even imagine if Abraham, just Abraham and Sarah, had 318 men and up to 2,000 perhaps others, how many would have gone down to Egypt with the 70 that were of Jacob's household? It would have been quite a company marching down there. Here's the point. When they went to Egypt, they departed the land and wickedness abhors a vacuum. In other words, the people of God suddenly were no longer in the land of Canaan. Suddenly there was, there was no representation there of God, of his covenants, of his righteousness. How many nations ended up filling that unoccupied space? Seven. This is why I didn't even joke around with flashlights and megabytes or anything like that. Hittites, Girgashites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites, and there were seven nations, seven nations greater and stronger than you, Moses said. Seven nations filled up the land very quickly. What did Jesus say in the parable? When he comes back and finds the house swept and unoccupied, the demon goes and gets seven others stronger than himself and comes in and fills the space. You could call the land of Canaan after the people of Israel departed a house overtaken by seven demonic principalities. Seven nations that were demonically driven, easily, evilly driven, wickedly driven, 
Now, that's not the interpretation of, of Jesus' teaching. We'll get to that in a bit, but it's close. It certainly is an application. It's an example of what Jesus was saying, that when a house is swept but left unoccupied, it's just open gain. And the land of Canaan was that. After Israel left the land, it was occupied and overrun by the worst kind of sick, inhuman, idolatrous, sexually immoral, heartlessly brutal sin. This land was darkness. It was ugly what was going on there. In fact, the Bible Knowledge Commentary says studies of their religion, literature, and archaeological remains reveal that they were the most morally depraved culture on earth. This was not a good place. Israel departed. All this mess came in. This was a dark place dark place we know that it was dark we know that it was bad for more than simply archaeological studies and and literature and and their religion and studying these historical documents we know because God told the people of Israel when you go back in there you utterly destroy them utterly destroy them this is something that people misunderstand. God wouldn't utterly destroy anything unless it was utterly evil. We know the character of God. Ezekiel 18, 23, Do I have any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God? Rather, that he should turn from his ways and live. That's God's heart. It is not God's heart to condemn the, the wicked or man or woman. It is that they would repent and live. That's forgiveness, that's grace that is held out to all the Lord is patient towards you. You know the verse, 1 Peter 2, 9, not wishing for any to perish, but all to come to repentance. If there's any hope for a man, any hope for a woman, God knows it and he holds out and he waits and he warns against sin and he seeks the opening in the heart. He gave the land of Canaan and these seven nations 400 years to repent of their evil. And someone could say, well, I don't see anywhere in the Bible where it says that he told them to repent of their evil. Well, it's not there because he's not dealing with them. He's dealing with Israel. The Bible is an historical document, yes, because it historically and accurately portrays what God was doing with Israel. We don't know what he was doing with the other nations. We get hints every now and then. But it is apparent that God was concerned for and interacting with the nations that were there, giving them time to repent. And they would have known, but they rebelled against it. So all this to say, while the primary reason that Israel returned to the land was because of God's covenant promises, the secondary reason was a righteous takedown of seven sinful nations. God needed a force to go in and wipe them out. He told Abraham 400 years prior in Genesis 15, 16, in the fourth generation they will return here for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. It's filling up. It wasn't quite there. 400 years later, it was utterly wicked in the land of Canaan. And by the way, what was the first nation to go down? Do you remember? We've just seen it. It's the Amorites. The Amorites. Sihon of Heshbon and Og of Bashan were Amorite kings. And what was it that God told Abraham? The iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. The Amorites were the first ones to be taken out. Even before the people came into the land, those that were on the outskirts of the land, Sihon and Og and their people, were wiped out by Israel. God sends in this, this force. God says, utterly destroy them. Because the occupiers of the land were already to the point of no return, no repentance, no regret. Utterly depraved. And the only option when it gets that bad is clean house. Take them out. When the Lord, verse 2, your God delivers them before you and you defeat them, then you shall utterly destroy them. You need to note this word. You'll see it more than once in Deuteronomy and, and even on into Joshua. Utterly destroy. Ha Harim. Harim is not just a, a, a one time basketball player. <laughs> Harim in the Hebrew means complete extermination. 
annihilation, but it's also translated ban. To utterly, absolutely ban. To ban from the land. To ban the presence of this people. Ha harim. When you go in, utterly destroy them. Ha harim. So, so much for live and let live, huh? Well, we'll just come and we'll take our spot and just leave them alone. You got a Canaanite living next door? That's cool. Not a big deal. Let them be. And this is the way that too many Christians deal with sin in our own lives. What may begin as a concerned awareness. I know I've got this temptation. I know I've got this lure. I know I've got this, this little thing here. A, a concerned awareness becomes a non-confrontational acceptance. And then a cultural appeasement leading to a consenting approval and final, finally complicit action. This is the pattern. And by the way, this has been the pattern of, sadly, tragically, much of the church in our country. Listen to it again. Beginning with a concerned awareness. We see something going on and we're worried about it. But then it becomes a non-confrontational acceptance. Just that's their thing. This is ours. We just won't deal with them. And then it turns into a cultural appeasement. How can we, you know, play nice? And then it leads to a consenting approval. Well, actually, is what they're doing all that bad in the first place? Ultimately, it will lead to complicit action. We're engaged. We're involved in the very sin that we once perhaps was aware, um, aware of and concerned about. And the thing that concerns me the most with the church at large is how we deal with sin in this society. It also concerns me with how the church internally deals with it. That is you and me. How we deal with sin in our own hearts. But it seems right now that culturally speaking, the church in America has already reached the point of consenting approval. Romans 1.32, Paul said, although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but they give hearty approval to those who practice them. Hey, it's all right. God loves everybody. Therefore, everybody can do whatever they want. That, that's Okay. We don't want to be seen as judgmental. We've bought the lie. The lie from society that Christians are judgmental. We bought it. We're afraid of it. So we don't want to say anything that makes us come across that way. You know what we've done? We've let unclean spirits into the house. Paul has a word for that, and the word is depravity. So what do we do? What do we do? How, how do we respond? How do we react personally and I want, I want us to think very personally this morning. I don't want to sit here as a church fellowship in judgment of the world around because we got plenty of mess to deal with ourselves. How do we internally deal with sin in our own lives? The sin that, that has kind of just become part of who we are. I'll give you some things to jot down if you want to note these. The first one is very simple. Radically ban the sin. Radically ban the sin the sin. The Lord says, you shall make no covenant with them, verse 2 continuing, and show no favor to them. Furthermore, you shall not intermarry with them. You shall not give your daughters to their sons, nor shall you take their daughters for your sons. Note this, for they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods, and then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you, and he will quickly destroy you. Guess what happened? Solomon was turned away from following the Lord by his many wives who were not of Israel. It's a tragic end to wise, glorious King Solomon's life to the point that where the Bible leaves it, we don't even know if Solomon was saved because he became an idol worshiper for all of the wonderful things he wrote that, that are in the Bible. Solomon himself, the, the, the last statement of his life was very simply... He chased after other gods because of his many wives. In fact, the same phrase, they will turn your sons away. They turned his heart away from following the Lord. Because he didn't ban, he didn't, utter, he didn't follow the prescription of the word. And there was that intermarrying going on. There was that unequal yoking, we would call it. 1 Corinthians 6, don't be unequally yoked, Paul says. 
It goes on in verse 5, it says, Thus you shall do to them. You shall tear down their altars, smash their sacred pillars, hew down their asherim, and burn their graven images with fire. Radically ban the sin. Leave no remnant of the sin. Now, I, I know why churches, especially in this country, have become so lax when it comes to immoral behavior. I get it. Compassion for the sinner often drives our desire to accept and appease and approve of the sin. I grew up hearing the phrase, perhaps you did too, love the sinner, hate the sin. The problem is we've taken love of the sinner and we've just ignored the sin. We've forgotten to hate the sin. And in our own lives, the same thing is true. See, truth, truth speaks in love. True compassion speaks the truth in love. It is not love to quiet ourselves and not speak what we know to be true. And I'm not saying we should be a Westboro Baptist church. You've seen enough in the news about that church going to the far extreme and being hateful and spiteful and mean-spirited and, yes, judgmental, but judgmental in a way they have no right to be. That's not what we're talking about here. True love sees beyond this temporary life and says, I know that right now this is how you, my friend, you, my family member, I know this is how you feel right now, but this is not the only life you have. And choices we make now will determine how we will live then. Skip down to verse 25 of chapter 7. All the way to the end there, he says, repeating, the graven images of their gods you are to burn with fire. You shall not covet the silver or the gold that is on them, nor take it for yourselves, or you will be snared by it. For it is an abomination to the Lord your God. Listen to that, that word abomination. There are things that God absolutely abhors. There are things that he looks at, and, and it's just, as far as he's concerned, it's sickening. It's so wrong. Verse 26, again, you shall not bring an abomination into your house. And like it, come under the ban, that is, under the destruction. You shall utterly detest it, and you shall utterly abhor it, for it is something banned. And there's the word again, harim, utterly ban. Now this, this ban includes all idols, all forms, images, and statues, false gods, and phony representations. A another clarification from last Sunday, and I did clarify this on Wednesday night too, it's not that you can't have a picture on your wall in your house. It's not that you can't have a nicely carved eagle that someone made for you. It's that you don't worship it. It's that you have no representation for God, no form for God, no idol or image for God. Nothing that stands between you and completely, openly, and honestly just worshiping and knowing Him. That's the issue. And so Moses is very strong on this. You get all that stuff out. Wipe it out. Utterly ban it. Now this will play out tragically with the spoils of Jericho. Their first battle engaged in the land where God puts everything in Jericho under the ban. Harim. Don't, those spoils are not for you. You don't take these things under the ban. But one man's secret sin resulted in the tragic deaths of 36 Israelites who unwittingly went up to fight the next battle not knowing there was sin in the camp. Listen to this, Joshua chapter 7, verse 20. So Achan answered Joshua and said, Truly I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel, and this is what I did. When I saw among the spoil a beautiful mantle from Shinar, a Babylonian mantle, and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold, 50 shekels in weight. Then I coveted them and I took them. And behold, they're concealed in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath it. So Joshua sent messengers and they ran to the tent. And behold, it was concealed in his tent with the silver underneath it. And they took, from the, they, they took them from the inside of the tent and they brought them to Joshua and to all the sons of Israel. And they poured them out before the Lord. And then Joshua and all, the, and all Israel 
with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, the mantle, the silver, the bar of gold, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that belonged to him, and they brought them up to the valley of Achor. Joshua said, why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. And all Israel stoned them with stones, and they burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. They raised over him a great heap of stones that stands to this day. And the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Therefore, the name of that place has been called the Valley of Accor to this day. That's harsh. That's intense. How do you explain that, Rick? When we get to Joshua, we will. But for this morning, understand I am not saying go find the Achan among us and destroy his Achan breaky heart. <laughs> okay, what I'm saying. And this is not, I'm not talking about, so please hear me in this, I'm not talking about how we are to act toward non-believers or even how we should treat fellow believers who are caught up in sin. See, in the New Testament, we know how we're supposed to handle that. Galatians 6, verse 1, Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, looking to yourself so that you, will, you too will not be tempted bear one another's burdens, and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. See, here's the thing. We are now under the law of grace. We are under the law of love and compassion. But what I'm doing here is applying the story of depraved Canaanite culture to our own acceptance and appeasement and approval and actions when it comes to sin in our own lives. What do we do with it? Put it down. Wipe it out. Utterly destroy it. How will we ever be able to, to, to be of any use to this sick and dying culture by joining it? How can you, by joining someone in their sin, lead them away from their sin? That doesn't make any sense at all. How can we embrace sin and then help people Find grace and forgiveness from that very sin that now we have embraced. You can't do it. And we've got to start with what is buried under our own homes. Things that we know, you know, should be under the ban, should be destroyed from our households. I was driving here this morning, as I often do, saying, okay, Lord, that's kind of a generic statement. Destroy the sin in your life. But I don't know what the sin in your life is. God hasn't given me that. I'm glad I don't know. I don't want to know. Don't tell me. <laughs> I got enough to deal with right here. But you know. You know what is buried under your tent. You know what is in your household. You know what you have accepted and embraced. You know. I, I don't. You do. God does. And the Lord would say to you, as he has said to me this week, utterly destroy the sin. Get it out. Ban it. Well, see, Israel, Israel didn't. And ultimately what happened is they came back into the land is they fell prey to the very evil and wickedness that the seven nations before them had been engaged in. The same stuff. Do you realize Israel was even sacrificing babies to Molech? They got that depraved. So depraved that ultimately God had to remove Israel from his land had to drive them out because the wickedness was so bad. Now you might say, well, if God knew that, what qualified them in the first place to be God's removal force? Why, if he knew Israel was going to fall to the sin, why did they get to the be the people who removed the sin before them? Verse 6, verse 6 of Deuteronomy 7, for you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession or his peculiar treasure. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth, the Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any of the peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But because the Lord loved you and kept the oath which he swore to your forefathers, the Lord brought you out by a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of a Pharaoh king of Egypt. Listen, what qualifies me, a sinner myself, 
to be part of the removal force against sin. Have you ever heard that from a a friend or a relative? We know you. Come on, you're not fooling anyone. I know you go to church now, that's fine, but what makes you so holy and righteous that you can judge me? I know you. I grew up with you. We've been friends a long time. Don't start pulling that holiness stuff on me. Who are you to act so holy? You ever hear that? Your answer is very simple. Well, I'm loved, chosen, delivered, and redeemed. That's who I am. And all the stuff that you know about me from the past, yes, is true. But something is even more true. I am loved, I am chosen, I am delivered, I am redeemed. That is why I have to pursue holiness. That is why I desire righteousness. I actually hunger and thirst after righteousness. Now, because God has made that change, because God has loved me, because he has forgiven me. Listen, not only do we, as I said, radically ban the sin, but secondly, recognize your holiness. Recognize your holiness. Don't shrink from it. Don't hide from it. Don't be ashamed of it. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Don't be ashamed that you have been made clean by Jesus Christ. Embrace that. I am a holy person. I don't look holy. I don't often feel holy, but I have been made holy by the blood of Jesus Christ, by his doing, not mine. I'm not arrogant enough to think that I've done something to make myself more righteous than I used to be. No, I'm still in the same old skin, but I have been made holy by Jesus Christ, by his blood. Romans 10.10, for with the heart a person believes resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. Who am I to claim to be holy, act holy, or try to live holy? I am a child made righteous by faith. I just believed. I am a child saved by confessing that Jesus is my Lord. And now, guess what? My Lord commands me to be holy as he is holy. That's part of the deal. To to hold fast to our holiness. Don't revel in your ragged unrighteousness. I get so sick and tired of hearing Christians talk that way. Well, I'm just a filthy sinner. Stop! You have been made clean by the blood of Jesus. Don't disregard that. Recognize your holiness. Walk in your holiness. That's not self-righteousness. There's a very clear distinction between the two. True holiness is extremely humble. Because you know where it came from, not me. From the blood of Christ. Self-righteousness is prideful and arrogant. That's a problem. So don't seek to be self-righteous, but recognize you have been made holy. Peter said in 1 Peter 1.14, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves in all your behavior, because it's written, you shall be holy, for I am am holy. Remember God said that in Leviticus 11? Be holy. Why, Lord? Because I am, and I've made you that way. Verse 7, again, listen to this. The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any of the peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. You know that Israel is still a tiny population on the world stage. It's still, today, 0.2% of the population of the world are the Jewish people. All all the Jewish, not just Israel, all the Jewish people. 0.2%. And yet, the Jewish people remain at the forefront of global attention. Isn't that bizarre? And does anyone else find that strange that we're always talking about Jewish people and Judaism and Israel and Jerusalem and the Temple Mount? It's constant in the news It's 0.2% of the world population. Leave them alone, ignore them, let them be. But we can't because they're chosen. Chosen today just like they were chosen then. Israel, the nation of Israel, is still number one in the world when it comes to startup ventures. No one comes close. Tel Aviv is a hotbed of technological startup 
uh, ventures. I, I think I told you before that our tour guide, Roni, one of his sons, came up with an idea, just an idea, not developed, nothing else to it, just an idea for a certain kind of app and, it, and was bought out for $2 million. What? I'm like, I got all kinds of ideas. <laughs> Israel remains on the list of the top 10 most powerful nations on earth. And they're the size of New Jersey. If someone tried to tell you that New Jersey was among the most powerful places. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? God told Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 verse 2. I will make you a great nation. And even as a secular nation today, Israel is a great nation in terms of its power on the world stage. Not in terms of size. No, it has nothing to do with size. But listen, where God is concerned, size and stature are not the measure of greatness. Never have been. In Israel's case, it is their chosenness. What makes the Jewish people so present in the world? They're chosen. What makes them such a target in this world? They're chosen. And the devil knows that and hates it. And the demons in the world are opposed to it. That's anti-Semitism. That's what drives it because nothing else makes any sense out of anti-Semitism. But the driving force of the demonic presence wanting to take Israel out. Why would he care? Why would Satan care? Because they are God's chosen people. He's made promises that must be fulfilled in them, through them, and for them. And if they're not, then God's a liar. So Satan is working very hard to take out this tiny people group. But again, it's not size and stature. It is chosenness. And listen, no Christian is great because you have some kind of stature in the church. That is not our measure of greatness. And no church is great because it happens to be big or trending in the world. That is not the measure of greatness. May it be, Paul writes, Galatians 6, 14, that I would never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world, and that is my measure of greatness. What makes you think you're great, Rick? The cross. You know what's great? I have been washed in the blood of Jesus at the cross, and that makes me great. Makes me greater than John the Baptist. Makes me among the great in the kingdom because I have been washed by the blood. That is my boast. The cross is my measure of greatness and yours. If you belong to Jesus, you, you know he loved you and chose you long before you chose and loved him. That's just great. Romans eight twenty nine. for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, and that is a holy image. So my friends, recognize your holiness. And radically ban sin. And now listen, as Moses gives a promise and a warning. The warning first, verse 9. Know therefore that the Lord your God, he is, he is God, the faithful God, who keeps his covenant and his loving kindness to a thousandth generation with those who love him and keep his commandments. But, and here's the warning, repays those who hate him to their faces to destroy them. He will not delay with him who hates him. He will repay him to his face. Therefore, you shall keep the commandment and the statutes and the judgments with which I am commanding you today to do them, Moses says. Here's the warning. God will repay the hateful. He will repay the hateful. Deuteronomy 32, verse 35. Moses is singing what's called the Song of Moses. And all of a sudden, in the midst of this song, he gets real serious. And he says, vengeance is mine and retribution. In due time their foot will slip. For in the day of their calamity, for the day of their calamity is near and the impending things are hastening upon them. He says in verse 41, if I sharpen my flashing sword and my hand takes hold on justice, I will render vengeance on my adversaries and I will repay those who hate me. God will repay the hateful. But listen, what, what does it mean in verse 10 where it says, repays those who hate him to their faces? 
Now, that might seem obvious to you. Well, it just means he repays them to their faces. What are you getting at? Listen, the way this translates is problematic in the Hebrew. There's one more problematic thing here that I'll show you in a minute. But this one, it's interesting because there's no there there. If you read it, it doesn't in the Hebrew say he repays those who hate him to their faces. It says he will repay those who hate him to faces. Now, some will translate this to his face. He will repay those who hate him to his face. Speaking of, 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 of his face, some Bibles translate it that way. Others say, well, no, wait, face is plural, so it has to be two faces, so the faces must be their faces. So he's going to repay those who hate him to their faces. He's going to get all up in their face. Well, which one is it? Is it, is it his face or is it their face? Two possibilities in how this can be translated, and both are correct, at least in terms of meaning. First one is this, those who hate him to their, to, not to their faces, but to faces in the world. That is, he will repay those who hate him to the world, who face the world with hatred for God, who express animosity to God among other people. He will repay them. The other way to translate this would be, he will repay those who hate him to his faces. To hate God is to hate the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's to hate all of his faces. In fact, Jesus said in John 15, 23, he who hates me hates my Father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would not have sinned. Talking about the Pharisees and the, the Jewish leaders. But now they both have seen and hated me and my father as well. To hate Jesus is to hate the father. To hate the father is to hate the son. To hate father or son is to hate the Holy Spirit. To hate him to his faces. Either way, God will fairly and righteously repay the hateful. Now, does that just sound like, wow, he's just a vengeful God? He is with unrighteousness. He is with those who hate him, but understand this. He is always straightforward and upfront about judgment. There are no tricks with God. He doesn't jump out and is, there are no gotchas. Ha ha, I knew you were going to be caught in your sin. Ha, surprise, found you sinning. Boom, you're out of here. That's not how God works. No one, when judged, will be able to say, well, that's not fair. No one, when God takes vengeance, will be able to say, but I had no idea. No. There are no surprises with God. In fact, that's why we have Bible prophecy. That's why from the very beginning he began warning of judgment. If you don't love him, if you hate him, there's going to be judgment. And he warns and warns and warns through all the pages of Scripture. And it's a prophecy. It's the way prophecy works. And by the way, Jesus' description of the swept and empty house in Matthew 12 was a prophecy of Israel. Here's the correct interpretation of this. Historically, the people of Israel did become so idolatrous that by 586 B.C., the final remnant of Israel, which was the kingdom of Judah, was swept away into Babylon, a horribly idolatrous nation. Across 70 years, the land was quiet and still. You could say it was swept and, and put in order. But when they returned to the land... Idolatry wasn't an issue anymore. They, they were cured of it. Like the whole, I used to, used to say like a smoker going to Schick Shadel and you just smoke, 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 smoke until you're so sick of smoking you don't want to smoke anymore and you're cured. I don't know if that always works. In this case, God said, you're sickly idolatrous. I'm going to put you in the capital city of idolatry and let it work its, its work on you. And by the time they came back to the land, idolatry was not an issue. From 500 or so, 530 uh, B.C. to the time of Christ, idolatry was not a thing in the land. Not anymore. The land was swept and it was put in order. But guess what? There was no idolatry, but there was also no faith. Oh, there were a few there are always a handful. There's always a remnant who believe. But by and large, the, the land of Israel was an empty land, though the Jewish people had come back. Jesus comes upon the scene. Do you realize what was going on when Jesus arrived? The house was filled with demonic activity. 
Why, you ever thought about that? Why was Jesus always having to cast out demons? Why did he have to send his apostles, his disciples, out to cast out demons? Because demonology was everywhere. Demon possession and oppression was all over the land. That, as it were, that one evil spirit went out and got seven more powerful than himself and came flooding back into the empty land, the land that had not been filled up with righteousness. Jesus gives this parable, and it's stunning in its specificity. And the people then, when Jesus came, they rejected their only hope Jesus Christ, and after 70 AD, the land spiraled into absolute desolation. Now it's filling up again because God keeps his promises. It is filling up with a people, but it is still largely a secular nation. Listen, still empty as a, on, on the national scene, still empty as a nation in this world. And listen to the last thing Jesus said in that, in that description, Matthew 12, verse 45. The last state of that man becomes worse than the first. That is the way it will also be with this evil generation. You get it? The last state will be really bad. And when you see gay pride parades marching through Jerusalem, you know it's really bad. The last state is not good. The land will be completely overrun again, not by seven nations, but for seven years. In the Bible, it's called the tribulation, and the one who will overrun the land at that time, the Bible calls Antichrist. It is never enough, never enough to sweep the house or the heart. It must then be filled. It must be filled. And God will repay the hateful. But, but, good news, he is ever the righteous judge. And he is forever the gracious father. So verse 9 says, Know therefore that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps his covenants and his loving kindness to a thousandth generation with those who love him and keep his commandments. And that's another interesting translation there. Fourth thing in your notes, if you're keeping track of this, is God will reward the faithful. He'll repay the wicked. He'll repay the hateful, but he will reward the the faithful, and it says to a thousandth generation. If you're reading the New American Standard Bible, a thousandth, there's a TH there, generation. Well, wait. What does that mean? Now, some of your Bibles, if you're not reading the New American Standard, you might have a different translation that says a thousand generations. A thousand generations or a thousandth generation. Well, which one is it? See, here's, here's the problem with translating this a thousand generations is that the word generation is singular. So he, he keeps his loving kindness, his grace to a thousandth generation. That's singular. That's speaking of one, the thousandth one. You get what, I, what I'm saying here? And this is so interesting to me because every time we've read this before or something like this, that he keeps his loving kindness to a thousand generations, the idea is generation after generation after generation, he offers up his grace. What Moses says right here, that thousandth generation, he's going to keep his grace even for that generation, that thousandth one, will still, will still be receiving the grace of God. Now, Moses may be speaking euphemistically, just looking across time and saying it's just God is faithful and will be faithful all the way to that thousandth generation. In fact, Matthew 24, 34 gives support for that. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, this generation or this people group, Israel, will not pass away until all these things take place. So it may be, you know, grace is just constant or, or I wonder, could this be prophetic? A slip of the tongue by Moses preaching, but the Spirit is on him. Could this be prophetic of that thousandth generation, the millennial kingdom, the thousand-year reign of Christ, the thousandth generation, that he will keep his grace all the way to there, the promised thousand-year reign. Either way, God's grace remains constant. God's grace is available today just as it was 2,000 years ago. As available to you and to me and to anyone who calls on the name of the Lord, they will still be saved today. Such is the love of God. Such is that wonder that he will reward the faithful. But stay with that thought. Look at verse 12. Then it shall come about, Moses says, 
Then it shall come about, because you'll listen to these judgments and keep and do them, that the Lord your God will keep with you his covenant and his loving kindness, which he swore to your forefathers. Oh, he will love you and bless you and multiply you. He will also bless you, the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground, your grain, your new wine, your oil, the increase of your herd, the young of your flock, in the land which he swore to your forefathers to give you. You shall be blessed above all peoples. And there will be no male or female barren among you or among your cattle. The Lord will remove from you all sickness. He will not put on you any of the harmful diseases of Egypt which you have known, but he will lay them on all those who hate you. This is remarkable. So, so radically ban the sin, recognize your holiness. God will repay the hateful, but God will reward the fruitful. He will reward the, the faithful with fruitfulness. He'll reward the faithful with fruitfulness. How does he do that? He makes the faithful fruitful. Yeah. He makes the faithful fruitful. Now get this, because I, I, this is kind of a cool thought for me, kind of new, that the fruit is itself a reward. And we've talked a lot about the rewards of those who follow the Lord. And Jesus says, I'm coming and my reward is with me. So there are rewards at the end of the age, and there are rewards in coming to the Lord, and, and I've always thought of rewards in terms of that, but guess what? The fruit itself is a reward. That is, it is an immediate reward. The fruit is. That is, if you're faithful, God's going to repay you with fruitfulness, and we know what that looks like. The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things there is no law galatians 5 22 and then 24 says now those who belong to christ jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires that sounds like utterly destroying doesn't it utterly destroying the flesh its passions its desires listen the reward is fruit you want to cultivate fruitfulness in your life crucify the flesh the fruit of the Spirit, which we talk about, and most of you are familiar with those, those nine aspects of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. You want that? Crucify the flesh. It's very simple. Crucify the flesh, desire the things of the Spirit. Romans 8, 13, for if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you're putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Think about it this way. Physically speaking, when flesh dies, it becomes fertilizer. No, that's really good. That's really good. Crucify the flesh, it becomes fertilizer, and you will become fruitful. It's brilliant. Thank you. I appreciate that. No, but that's, that's how it works. We kill the flesh. We say no to the flesh. And when the flesh dies, the fruit, the fruit begins to grow. I, I've been crucified with Christ. Galatians 2.20. Nevertheless, it's not I who lives, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me, who gave himself up for me. And so God repays with fruitfulness. He rewards us with, with fruitfulness. We just crucify the flesh. He makes us fruitful. It's really cool. Verse 15, the Lord will remove from you all sickness, and he will not put on you any of the harmful diseases of Egypt which you have known, and he will lay them on all who hate you, does that mean I won't get COVID? <laughs> what about our cancers, our heart diseases, all of our physical ailments? Do we just need to have better faith so that we don't get these things? Hey, first of all, understand that our healing is so much better than this life. And, and I, I stand on that principle. There are other pastors, there are other churches, there are other movements not that we're a movement, but there are other movements out there where the whole focus is healing now, healing now, healing now. That's fine and well and good, and I believe that the Lord heal, heals now. And I believe that he, he brings powerful, uh, miraculous, supernatural healing and that we can pray for that and ask for that. I get it, but my healing is so much better than this flesh. Heal me today, I will still die tomorrow unless I'm caught up. So you can do all the healing you want. Everyone that Jesus healed died. Everyone that Jesus raised from the dead had a second funeral. 
Well, yeah, but, but what about this, this promise of, of, of removing all sickness and, and harmful diseases? Well, he's talking to Israel. It's a covenant promise to Israel back in Exodus 15, 26, that if they would keep his commandments and follow him and love him with their lives, that he would keep from them these diseases. Now, I can tell you this much about Israel. The Jewish people have remained remarkably resilient. Over the years, and you all know this, but back in the time of the Black Plague, the Jewish people were blamed for that. Know why? Because they weren't dying. They were surviving. They were actually thriving when most of Europe was going down from this plague. Why? They were abiding by the commandments of Torah. So their eating was healthier and, and more right, and, and there's still a chosenness factor there. So God makes this promise to the people of Israel, I'm going to keep you from the sickness. You just, you just do the right thing. I will, I will reward you with fruitfulness. Now, last thing, last thing, so listen up. There are some sins that we have carried so long, they're buried deep. There are some sins, and I'm just making the assumption, perhaps in your life, in my life, so big, so strong, so overwhelming that people feel like giving up. I'll deal with this stuff, but that one is just way too big. So how do we deal with sin that's dug in? How do we deal with sin that's dug in? Verse 17. Actually, go verse 16. You shall consume all the peoples whom the Lord your God will deliver to you. Your eyes shall not pity them, nor shall you serve their gods, for that would be a snare to you. Verse 17, if you should say in your heart, these nations are greater than I, how can I dispossess them? Application. This addiction to uh, pornography is just too great. How can I overcome it? The desire to drink is just too strong. How can I stop? The foul mouth, the outburst of anger, the wandering eyes, the greed, the foolish pride. I'm not giving you a laundry list of Rick's sins, by the way. Just... <laughs> Just being generic here. All these things that we struggle with, these big, giant things in our lives that we think, I, I, I don't know, I can't overcome that. You mean, you mean the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life that is from the world? Yeah, that. My sins are like giants in the land. How do we deal with sin that's dug in? Number five in our list, remember your deliverance. Remember your deliverance deliverance verse 18 you shall not be afraid of them you shall well remember what the lord your god did to pharaoh and to all egypt the great trials which your eyes saw and the signs and the wonders and the mighty hand and the outstretched arm by which the lord your god brought you out so shall the lord your god do to all the people of whom you are afraid i love that listen when you invited jesus in he really delivered he cleaned and swept your house but you know what he never left he swept you clean he made you righteous and he took up residence in your heart and he promised never to leave but that sin is too big let him fight for you trust that the one who delivered you already to salvation is here in the home in the house in the heart to fight to never go away. Paul says in Romans 8, 10, if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, and by the way, he does, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. And verse 12, he says, moreover, the Lord your God will send the hornet against them until those who are left and hide themselves from you, perish. God's going to send a hornet on a head. That's cool. What does that mean? Well, some think it was perhaps another invading force, maybe even Egypt, or, or another invading force outside the land that would be like a hornet against the seven nations that are there and weaken them as, as Israel was coming to fight. That's one thought. Others think perhaps it was just a stinging fear that there would be this, you know, like this PTSD that they would hear the Jewish people coming and they would just freak out and run. And the hornet was more symbolic. Uh, others think, no, it was hornets, man. 
He just sent hornets. And the people were like, wah, and, and running. As Israel's showing up, they're, you know. Here's the thing. Here's the point. <laughs> the point. Hornets. <laughs> here's the point. Joshua 24, verse 12 repeats this. Then I sent the hornet before you, and it drove out the two kings of the Amorites from before you, not by your sword or your bow. Remember your deliverance. Remember what I did. I even sent the hornet to drive it out. And here's the point. When it comes to God doing what he says he's going to do, just believe him. (laughs) You know, it, it actually looked bad on paper, too. Seriously, listen to me. One of the greatest blessings, and I mean this with all seriousness, one of the greatest blessings of living here at the end of the age is we have all of history watching God say he's going to do something and do it. So all we have to do is remember our deliverance. Look at what he's done. Is he capable? Is he faithful? Will he do it? I'm looking at big giants in my life. How am I going to overcome this? God will do it because he said he would. And every time he said he would, he does. Faithful is he who calls you and he will also bring it to pass. First Thessalonians 5, 24, Philippians 1, 6. I'm confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. So remember your deliverance in verse 21 You shall not dread them, for the Lord your God is in your midst, a great and awesome God. The Lord your God will clear away these nations before you. Little by little, you will not be able to put an end to them quickly. The wild beasts would grow too numerous for you, but the Lord your God will deliver them before you and will throw them into great confusion until they are destroyed. Little by little? Oh, man. I wish God would just make me holy all at once. You know, I believe in you, Lord Jesus. Holiness. I would. Wouldn't you love to have like this this veneer, this sheen that just, you know, so sin just just slides right off, can't get in. You're holy. You're just. You're perfect. You're done. Sanctification overnight. And that's not how it works. You're holy. God views you as holy, sees you as holy, has saved you, has seated you in the heavenly places with Christ Jesus. That's a done deal. Now he's sanctifying and working on you. And it's little by little by little. Why? Because God is big on faithfulness. And even as he is faithful, he is teaching us to be faithful. And so it's a step at a time. Sometimes your sanctification goes and you you get sanctified real quick in certain areas. But you and I both know we still got stuff that needs cleaning out. Which is part of the reason Jesus has remained resident in your heart. He's still at work. He's still cleaning out. Bottom line is if you're still alive on this planet, you need some sanctifying. Those of you who are a lot older than me, I don't know what your problem is. God's sanctifying work is part of the deal, and it is sometimes little by little by little. But listen, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, no temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. Faith comes incrementally. Endurance is required. Sanctification, that is that lifetime process. So fight on, fight on, and remember your deliverance as you fight. He will deliver their kings, verse 24, into your hands so that you will make their name perish from under heaven. No man will be able to stand before you until you have destroyed them. Paul says, in all things, Romans 8, 37, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. 
I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And again, verse 26 says, you shall not bring an abomination into your house and like it come under the ban. You shall utterly detest it and you shall utterly abhor it for it is something banned. So don't leave the house empty. Don't leave the house empty. Welcome the presence of God. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Utterly ban sin from your life. Let Jesus into your heart and we will know all the promises of God. Amen? Amen. Let's stand up together. I just love the Word of God and I, I love how practical and applicable it is. And while we are not fighting Canaanites, we are yet, we are yet rejecting sin. First and foremost, in our own lives, in our own hearts. Secondly, in our families, our household. Thirdly, in our church fellowship. And fourthly, in the world, while we continue to love those who are lost, we hate the sin that causes lostness. Don't ever embrace the sin. Hate it. Abhor it, because God does. And love people enough to speak the truth to them. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you don't pull any punches with us, but you are absolutely clear and genuine and upfront so that we can be certain about what is true and what is not. And Father, I pray for our hearts this morning. Lord, for every believer, every follower, no matter how much we may be struggling with certain sin issues in our lives, I pray, Father, that there would be a new revival in our hearts to trust in you, to remember that we are a delivered people. Lord, to, to recognize you made us holy and to radically ban the sin. Father, here at the end of the age, would you show each one of us what it means to clear things out. May we join you, Lord Jesus, in the sanctification process of our own lives. May we be part of the house cleaning, recognizing things that ought not to be in us and pursuing truly the holiness to which you have called us. Father, I pray for the person, perhaps even here among us this morning, who has not received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that the whole issue, Lord, of, of your faithfulness, which is even to judge those who hate you, Lord, that that would not be the frightening issue. It would be the realization of your great grace and your love which even allows us to talk about these things today Father I pray for lost people I pray for those who have never made a commitment to Jesus I pray for those who would ask Jesus this morning into their heart just to have the courage and the desire and if that's you I invite you to pray this prayer right now as we stand pray with me Lord Jesus I'm a sinner and I need forgiveness and I need your grace I believe that you went to the cross and that you died for the sins of all people specifically you died for my sins and I confess this morning that you rose from the dead and Lord I want to rise with you so receive me as your son receive me as your daughter your child this morning and teach me each day forward. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.